Hello, Shalane. I'm some guy with piercings who is now some guy who paints. I'm traditionally a music man, the studio guy. Close, like G next to N when you're trying to spell known, but still it makes sense. Got my iPod in my pocket and my daughter on the track. I think they both prove I got music in my jeans, 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 jeans. I got a family, but I would say fuck them. I got a brother, if I see him, then I'm cut him. I got a mum, so the heart, so she's worth nothing. Love him and leave him. Those two are kids, and I love them. Um, sound engineer, the most underrated job in music. Because people never ask about the sound engineer. It's like they don't care about them, but more often than not, it's us that make the song great. All the little touches that you fall in love with in a particular song. That's me, bro. <laughs> but no one ever knows. All you ever hear about is the artist, obviously, and the producer. And, I guess, the executive producer. The executive producer actually gets the credit for a good engineer's job, I would say. Well, old school, when you still had the CDs and you had the, the inlays, on the back there was always executive producer. And before I was in music, I always thought like, yeah, that person must be the, the big boss. Like, they must make all the final decisions with regards to the creation of the project. As I got into music, discovered the executive producers, none of that. They just put their name there at the end because they had the most clout in the business world or something or maybe they're a bully like Suge Knight and they say I, I made all the records no you didn't bro <laughs> like, more often than not any any beautiful song is a combination between the artist slash songwriter and the engineer the producer in modern day thinks they're something but all they've done is make the beat like just sit down and enjoy what you made. You get, get what I'm saying? And I know a lot of producers are going to be like, what are you talking about, bro? I know no, you don't, bro. We just humour you. We just humour you. You made that beat to just listen to you. you. You never made that beat with the concept of vocals being added to it and a particular kind of vocal, etc., etc. You just made a beat and you're bam, bam. So the song comes from the artist and the engineer those little or that little bit of reverb on the end of that last note and that hit song you love that's the engineer well the easiest way to prove that they're underrated and underappreciated is in five seconds i want you to name one now unless you're actually deep within music I'm 99% sure, and you did not name one. <laughs> that just shows how underappreciated we are. The only people that actually love us are the musicians and the stars that you love. Everyone else thinks we just press buttons. There's been loads. Well, I guess for various reasons, I'd have to pick various artists. For for nostalgic reasons, um, I'd have to say Alexander O'Neill. Um, it was just before he was in British Celebrity Big Brother, which was weird. He, in studio, he was like uncle, you know? Like, considering he was an 80s legend, a music, an, an American icon. He was like uncle, but I learned the most from his sessions because he sang with his whole body and he's the only person I've ever met or ever worked with that did that. Most people sing from the diaphragm if they've got any kind of education. If not, they just sing from their throat. But he sung with his entire body. There wasn't a molecule in his body that didn't move. 
with every single note and you could hear the difference you could literally hear hear the soul being left in the microphone it was a beautiful experience if i could work with one one artist for the rest of time the answer for me is easy and to be honest the answer hasn't really changed for pretty much the length of time my children have been alive it's it's a young gunner called Giovanni. please look him up he used to be sonical um but when he grew he went to his actual name which i always told him he should do even though he's a rapper i always told him like your name's bad like who's called Giovanni? just use your name and eventually he did but he by far is my favorite artist his, his talent is unmatched like literally I've, I've not heard anyone in the uk as good as him ever so that is my answer it's mainly i'm a portrait artist and i guess you could say a political artist not in the sense of doing ad campaigns like vote a and c but I find it I find it hard to paint the joys of life because life the joys of life in general for most people are fleeting real life is about pain and suffering so I think that's what I try and paint I'll be real not even that long you know I don't know what happened uh, in primary school and secondary school, I was really good at drawing. In primary school, I was one of the best. In secondary school, there was a lot more competition and I lost confidence a little bit, but it was still the only decent GCSC I got. But then eventually I fell into music and that was it. I didn't draw nothing from school. And then COVID come along, first lockdown. I was like, cool, I'll just make music at home. And then within a week, I dropped my laptop and I couldn't record. And I was like, what, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do. So my partner at the time, she suggested that I paint something because she had a few canvases lying about. So I did. I painted my dog. And I recognised him. I was like, what? And then that became my new love. Number one is patience. I think that's part of the reason why I'm able to paint as being a sound engineer. Yes, you, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of amazing artists, but a big part of my day was working with people who were never gonna make it. So it was a lot of tedious sessions, especially when you're working with artists in the style of music that doesn't crap you so you can get very tired and the sessions go on for days sometimes so you that really grooms your knowledge of patience and that is my biggest advantage at the moment with painting is most of the time I don't feel like it's going well, but I have patience and belief that I will get there in the end. It's very easy to do one brush stroke and think, mm, and then just rub the whole thing away. No, just stick at it, keep moulding it. The only person you need to please is you. Anyone else likes it, it's a bonus, but your life is about you. So make yourself happy. If you enjoy a piece, that makes it perfect. There's a lot of people walking about and I don't understand how because they obviously don't have a heart so what's pumping the blood around their body? Most people who have a conscience their heart is breaking and like most people I feel helpless. What can we do? Israel claims to have the right to defend itself. 
but they're going to war with children. 40% of Gaza's population is under the age of 15 and they have nowhere to go. And the space of Gaza is one fifth the size of London. And in the first six days of the quote unquote war, Israel dropped 6,000 bombs into that space. I'm also angry. I'm angry at the hypocrisy. I'm angry at the lack of compassion, the lack of empathy shown towards the children of Palestine, shown towards anybody in Palestine. The lack of humanity. Do we see them as humans? Or do we just see them as punching bags? made available to to suffer, to quench the thirst of Israeli vengeance. And the fact that all our governments are just standing by and saying, yeah, this is, this is, this is fine. This is justified. Israel has a right of defending herself. Against who? The children of Gaza? Showing any support towards Palestine somehow gets deemed as being a terrorist sympathizer. Like what? Israel with the terrorists in this situation. But yet, yeah, as a British citizen, I'm more than welcome to go and join the IDF. So Having limited choices, what can we do? The only thing I could think to do was try and express my heartbreak and in pain. With the, with the hope that I'll be able to sell the, the collection and donate the proceeds to a charity I found that is attempting in some small way to help the people of Palestine. A charity is called MAP. Medical Aid for Palestinians. According to Oxfam, before October the 7th, the only day that matters to a lot of people, the people of Palestine needed a hundred lorries worth of humanitarian aid a day, which they were not getting. That was before October the 7th. Before Israel began their campaign of dropping 6,000 bombs in the space of six days. They need every last little bit of help they can get. Two piece is, it's a play on words. Literally, hopefully we're on the journey to peace. But it's also an artwork comprising of two pieces. The first piece, the main piece, is a troubling one. A child holding flowers, seemingly offering them to whoever's looking his face dirty. Surrounded by the catastrophe that is Gaza. So in the background, there's a lot of detail. There's, there's the Christian church that was destroyed by the IDF. There's bullet holes everywhere. There's buildings on fire. Hospitals destroyed. The Palestinian flag waving proudly. In the middle ground, as a father, babe and his two children, son and a daughter. They've got bubbles. They don't have walls, but they have bubbles. On one of the destroyed bits of a wall, you'll see a bit of Hebrew as if spray painted. And the Hebrew says Israeli Defence Force. 
is even a random teddy bear in the foreground, just strewn across the floor. Everywhere is carnage. But the father and his two children having bath time, they're happy because they're still alive. Looking upon this thing is another man. A uniformed man. A man of the IDF. Armed. Spying, looking for his next target. His next target is... Annoyingly, I wish I just made it all up, but all my reference material are real photographs. You can find them online yourselves. I put a lot of different images together. The teddy bear I invented, <laughs> why not? I found the image of the father with his children. That broke me. And it was around the time the idea for claiming they didn't strike one hospital. And then a few days later, they went and blew up another one. I can't escape. I can't escape. vivid attempts to try and comprehend what everybody is going through. I talk about the children because in our global political landscape, children and women are used to protect community. Women and children are not protected, but it's claimed they are. And they, they are used to attack gay people, for example, trans people, Muslims. But never to actually fix the problems that are occurring in their life, like rape and sexual assault. No one cares about that, but they do care about people reading books to children. So, you claim to care about the children, let's talk about the children. 40% of Gaza is under the age of 15. Just try and imagine whatever city you live in. I live in London. It's like walking out, spending a day walking around sightseeing, and near enough every other person you see is a child. That, that's literally who they're at war with. On top of that, they're trapped in a small confined space with nowhere to go. IDF keep making me laugh, talking about human shields, human shields. If you're in London, for example, or whatever city you are in, you are not trapped in that city. There's no walls keeping you within that space. And that space, chances are, is quite huge. If you know London, Gaza is one-fifth the size of it. But as an example, just using London, I would have no confident that my loved ones would survive if the British government decided to drop 6,000 bombs on London. And we have the ability to leave. We have the ability to escape. I would have, I would see it one, two percent chance we would get out, but yet somehow the Palestinians, they're all trapped by Hamas. Even if Hamas stayed over in one corner, you still cannot get to them without destroying everything in your path. And that is what they are doing. What about the children? Seems like no one actually cares. And Every now and again we get proof of that, and this is that proof.
But of course, Israel has the right to defend herself. So all them parents just have to suck it up. The most heartbreaking thing I heard about life in Gaza is children. Children having their names written on their legs. And you'd think this is when they found the bodies and they'd, they'd been identified, so. No. This is at the beginning of the day, for example. A child wants to go and play. Who knows what's going to happen today? So the parent, me, for example, writes my name's child. My ch writes my child's name on them. In the event that they are killed, they can be identified. How do you how do you conceptualize that thought process? That huh? So whenever I think of Gaza, whenever I think of Palestine, whenever I hear Rishi or Keir Starmer, all I'm, all my head is seeing is the children and the parents having to find ways to reassure themselves that Israel's right to do this. Escape our Sheba. Pretty self-explanatory. That's not necessarily the child's parent. Probably isn't the child's parent, but it doesn't stop the person from panicking, feeling the child's pain. And there seems to be a resigned look on a child's face. Where are they going to? Where can they go? If a hospital is not safe, where? Where can they go? I think when I look in that child's face, they've already given up. And we do that. We've done that to them. Home is as we run. Another play on words. Home is where the heart is. But if you're escaping bombs and you're carrying all your possessions, including your children, you, that moment becomes home. Everything that matters to him is there. I can only assume he's lost more. Why it bothers me so much is when people think of Palestine, they talk about Palestine. Even everyone's a terrorist, apparently. Everyone wants to destroy all Jewish people, etc. But even when you acknowledge the people. You're barely allowing us to acknowledge the children or the women. The men, forget about it. Every man that's walking about in Gaza is obviously Hamas and obviously a threat. I don't see that. I see dads. I see brothers. I see people trying to protect their own in the worst circumstances imaginable. Protected. You can see the anguish on mum's face. Where is she going? Where are we going from? What direction are... is dangerous? What direction is safer? The child almost seems accepting of the situation. But of course, they've got no real 
at that age they've probably got no real comprehension of how much worse things can still get whereas mum mum is at a point where she's absolutely frightened of what could still happen whilst trying to come to terms with the shock of what has happened that's a horrifying place to be my Italian superman is based on the image of somebody else you'll see in the voices of palestine collection I've done it in a bit of a different style because the, I guess, I guess the details don't matter. There is no perfection in this moment. Suffering is everywhere. But we still got to survive. I don't need to know this woman's face to know she, she exists. And this image is taken through the eyes of Motez, one of the brave journalists in regards of risking their life. Hehehe <laughs>